I mean, I'm Steve Brown. I work down at the Sandbox uh, with the Bank Post. Um, and we have brought uh, Dr. Bishop here uh, to help us think about one of our core projects, which is uh, thinking about the future of the world of online trading. Um, but he is also uh, excited to talk with you. He, uh, he started off as the director of the Future Trend Program at the University of Houston. He's now leading Future Solutions, uh, which is aimed at bringing um, future thinking and methodologies and processes into and mindsets into hotels and online trading. Um, so he's here to talk about that. He can tell you a little more than I can about it. So we're really really excited to hear uh, more about that. Really, this is uh, he'll give give a short presentation uh, about the work. Great, thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. <coughs> uh, I actually have two short presentations, so <laughs> and we'll have a chance to to discuss things in between time. Um, the question that they asked me is, did I want to be a futurist when I was five years old? The answer to that is no. Um, did I ever want to be a futurist before I came to the University of Houston? I didn't even know that such a thing existed when I came to the University of Houston. I was recruited to teach statistics, which I. I took two more math courses than most sociologists, so I kind of knew my way around a p, you know, p value and teaching undergraduates and graduate students and behavioral sciences to do that. Uh, the University of Houston Clear Lake was one of the new universities, new campuses created in Texas in the, uh, in the 1970s. Texas made a huge amount of money in the first uh, oil crisis because the price of oil went up by ten, tenfold and all the royalties coming out of the East Texas oil field and the Permian Basin and things like that. And to their credit, they put a lot of that into universities and colleges, built them all over the place. The Texas A&M system, the UT system now, University of Houston got three new campuses, one of which was the Clear Lake campus right by the Johnson Space Center. And uh, I, was, uh, I was headed there. The deans were traveling around at that time because they couldn't bring everybody in. They were hiring lots of faculty. And towards the end of our lunch um, at uh, Atlanta Airport, I said, uh, what, what is this thing in the catalog called Studies of the Future? And I probably had a little bit of e edge on it. Of course, the dean there was a very outspoken, <laughs> flamboyant guy. He wasn't going to let that, that let, let that pass. He said, well, we study the past, don't we? I said, yeah. Well, why can't we study the future? Well, I wanted the job, so I had a lot of reasons why you couldn't study the future. And I kept my mouth shut and got the job. Um, and as a matter of fact, there is a lot of parallels between studying the past and the future and, and some differences. I uh, taught STAT for about six or seven years, but my real passion when I entered sociology was to study social change, which I, I don't know if there are any sociologists in here, but there is very little social change taught in sociology, unfortunately. I took over the social problems course in my first assignment in Georgia, which was about as close to change as you get, but I didn't even know there was such a thing called future studies. So I hung around with the faculty and interested in change in the future, and so I said, could I uh, teach, uh, teach in this program? And they said, sure, how would you like to run the program? <laughs> you know, the newest kid, you know, <laughs> gets to talk to the dean and do all of that kind of stuff. So uh, I became what I call the accidental futurist. Didn't know I was gonna become that. That was the early 1980s and retired from that position 30 years later. Uh, great run, and uh, I'm so lucky and, and, and privileged to, to have been part of this new and emerging field. Um, so the, the, the story is a fairly short one. Uh, studies of the future, my first talk uh, here this, this afternoon is to give you some sense of this as a field and as an academic discipline. I want to tell you that it's real. The good news is that we now know how to teach this stuff. The University of Houston Clear Lake, because of the leadership of this dean and its first chancellor, um, was the first degree, Master of Science degree in, stu in future studies uh, in the world. Uh, there are now about a half a dozen graduate programs around, and I'll show some more stats about the field here in a second. Uh, the, um, the, the, the 1970s, the early, late 60s and early 70s was a kind of a, what I'll call a golden age of future studies. A uh, lot, of, lot of change in the air during those times, as if you, those of you who either read about it in history class or even lived it as I did. Uh, the civil rights movement, uh, environmental movement starts then, uh, the um, war in Vietnam, uh, all of these kinds of things. Lots of turbulence, a lot of discussion about change in the future and things like that. Alvin Toffler wrote during that time. 
uh, Janella Meadows and the Limits to Growth, Paul Ehrlich and the Population Bomb, Rachel Carson. So those were kind of the, the it, was, it was in the water already. We were kind of talking about it then, and that's why Cal Cannon could create this degree, and everybody said, and, and it was m only one of a number of interdisciplinary degrees that they created, but that one won stock because they hired two very capable faculty members to staff the program. As I told everybody, it's hard to get a new program into uh, a university or a college, uh, but it's just as hard to get one out <laughs> once it's there. It's kind of like locked into the concrete matrix. So we were there for another 25 or 30 years, even though the rest of the university had gone off to be kind of a wide spot in the road of higher education, nothing truly remarkable. We lasted there till 2005, and because it was just hard, hard to get rid of us, and finally they figured out how to do that. And we moved then to the central campus of the University of Houston, which was actually a much more, uh, even though it's a research university, which we're not particularly, it was a much more uh, accommodating environment. We're doing really well, doing very well there. So that's, uh, that's where all that came from. So let me talk about the, the field itself. First of all, there are any number of definitions, and I'm going to do some names here in a little bit. But right away, uh, future studies or strategic foresight, the ability to create and sustain a variety, a variety of high quality forward views and to apply emerging insights in useful ways. I will make the distinction all the way through that there is a professional level, which would be a professional futurist or a foresight professional, we call them, or there is, there is the, the public level, which is really what I'm here to talk about, and that is what everybody should know in terms of dealing with the future. It turns out that we come out of high school and college with some misimpressions, which when we begin to talk to adults in seminars and certificate programs and things like that, we have to first kind of undo, and then we go on uh, from there. So it's uh, assessing the implications, detecting and avoiding problems, considering implications, and envisioning plausible and desired futures. As a set of learning objectives, wouldn't that be great that every college student had the opportunity to do that? I mean, I'm going to be truly bold and say, we have history in the core curriculum. Why not have the future in the core curriculum? We're not necessarily equal time, but that's obviously where we're headed and where we're going to go. So that's what the field is about. It is about the long-term future, and it has a particular approach to that future, which is a little bit different than what we mostly think when it comes to the future. I point out, however, that disciplines were never created uh, as part of uh, all of human civilization. They were all created at a time. So history, now 2,500 years old, was more or less created by these two gentlemen, Herodotus called the future, the, the father of history, and his uh, datas was traveling around the, the Eastern Mediterranean. And he, as opposed to the myths and the legends of the Homeric period, he actually described people as they were. So he went to see the Egyptians and the Phoenicians, Carthaginians and all those folks, and said, yeah, they're different, but they're not the one-eyed Cyclops and they're not the sirens of, of, of the Odyssey and things like that. They're real people, but they eat differently, they have different beliefs and religions, but so he was really kind of more of an anthropologist than a historian. Thucydides was a general in the Peloponnesian War, on the losing side, by the way, the first uh, memoir <laughs> of, a, of a high official, and he basically described that war not as Homer did with the Iliad, but the real war, no gods are dropping in and no myths and, and no magic is happening. So they really invented a description of the past that was different than anything that had ever been created before. That itself was a revolution in thinking. I would like to think that we are doing a similar thing now with respect to the future. I sure hope so. And there are various levels of that and how that's going along. So the history of the future itself is actually does not begin until, well, as a futurist, two or three hundred years ago is fairly short term, fairly recent. During the time of the Enlightenment was really where the concept of social change first emerged and therefore the future. The future as different. Now, we had the, the Jewish and the Christian and the Islamic religions all had their eschatological futures, the coming of the Messiah or the second coming and those kind of things. But there was nothing uh, approaching uh, what you might call a trend or change in anyone's lifetime. It just was not a concept that, that existed. People were born into, they lived, and they died in pretty much the same society. I mean, there was change, there was a war passed through the peasants' farms, or the king died and another would take over, so there were some changes. 
but society itself was structured as it was always going to be. So there was not this concept of societal change. So comes along the Industrial Revolution beginning in the 18th century, and all of a sudden people reflected on the fact that, you know, my life is different than my father's and my grandfather's life. Oh, well maybe my children's life and my grandchildren's life will be different. So they began to see the change within, if, if not their lifetime, within the lifetime of their extended family. And so they realized that there was motion going on in society, that there really was change. These two French intellectuals, one wrote a utopia about the future. The first utopia since Thomas More wrote was all of his utopias were contemporary. They were other places. Now Sebastien Mercier writes about other times, and that is a book about the year 2440, saying this technology, this improvement is going to go on. They had fairly uh, happy views of that. Of course, there were also some not so happy views that Thomas Malthus was saying, hey, hey, wait a minute. And so we already had scenarios even at that time about how the future might emerge. Science fiction, trends, the professionalization of the future, and some of the foundations of that, and I'll talk about that in a second. In, uh, in Europe, it began as a public discussion in the 1950s with intellectuals writing books. In the U.S., it began more in secret really in the Defense Department and the Rand Corporation beginning to think about literally the consequences of nuclear war, a whole brand new kind of warfare once that was, uh, once the missiles started to fly, planning time was over and we needed to have be, be prepared for those kinds of things. So in that sense, How's that? Okay, great. Sorry about that. Uh, so forecasting developed as a profession. The first trend study in the U.S. was right around 1930, commissioned by the Hoover administration and finally delivered uh, after FDR was created. And now we have basically traditional forecasting. That's econometrics, that's uh, population, demographic forecasting, and things like that. Planning also began in the 20th century uh, with um, the PBBS system in the 1960s, strategic planning and the, uh, the competitive strategies and all that. So these are the traditional approaches to the future which, uh, which we are going to uh, use, but we're also going to extend. So the invention of foresight takes that foundation and goes in a different direction. As I said, in Europe, they were doing it as, as basically recovering from World War II and saying, how could this, or even World War I, how could this happen? This is awful. Nobody predicted this. We need to have a, a, a consideration of that. And then all of the writers here in the U.S., both Khan and the rest, as I mentioned. Uh, and Jim Dater and Wendell Bell, two uh, professional educators in the futures field, were uh, teaching futures back in the 1960s. Dater at the Virginia Tech and Bell at at, uh, at Yale, and so there were just scatterings of those. Uh, the World Futures Society was created in 1967. The World Futures Federation, an international futurist organization, created in 71. Uh, Dater started his program at the University of Hawaii right around that time. We created the futures program at the University of Houston in 75, and everything from there went on. We have other organizations, and the Association of Professional Futurists now is, uh, is fairly substantial. Uh, there are now more than 500 people who identify themselves as professional futurists and pay a nominal fee to be part of that association. Way more than when we thought 15 years ago when we had about 20 people. <laughs> so we're really, really delighted with that. Journals, academic peer-reviewed journals by some of the major publishing organizations and companies, consultancies. Steve and his group went out to the Institute for the Future, Palo Alto. There have been others. Uh, going along. So I guess my point overall is that this is a real thing. Uh, this could have been called a fad in the 80s because in, uh, in the 70s because frankly the field almost went away in the 80s. The amount of change slowed down, various reasons for that. The baby boom first of all had to go to work <laughs> so they had to cut their hair and put on a suit and get a mortgage and build their families uh, so that, that that engine of change was not. Uh, the, sh the mood shifted from the kind of crazy, chaotic, we're going to change the world, to the more settled, 
uh, Republican, if you will, uh, Ronald Reagan, the kind of paternal father figure saying, let's all just calm down, it's fine, we'll just you know, go ahead. So our, our enrollment, which was pretty nice in the, in the 70s, went down to single digits in the middle of the 1980s. But then what happened? The Berlin Wall came down, Soviet Union collapsed, First Gulf War, the World Wide Web, Y2K, the tech bubble, blah, 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 blah. All of these disruptions came along and said, you know, we think this, uh, this thing is a little bit harder to do than it looks like. It's not very easy of dealing with this uncertain and disruptive future, which is actually increasing more and more. So that is basically the rationale for how this degree and how this program and how this professional field is beginning uh, to emerge. We do have a naming problem. <laughs> Early on, there are different names for different things. We didn't have any of these three names in this red box here when I uh, first started with the program. In fact, in the 1980s, we told our graduates, do not put the word futurist on your resume. <laughs> that was a deal breaker from the get-go. You'll be some kind of wild-haired, crazy person who's just out to make trouble fuzzy-headed and all of those kinds of things. We were, at that time, still trying to live down the stink that came from uh, tarot cards and, and palm reading and, and you know, uh, forecasters of various types. I think we've kind of moved away from that. But I started to see the word futurist in the late 1980s appear in business journals. Phones started to ring. We need a futurist to come and talk to us about, give a, give a keynote or come do a seminar, a workshop, and things like that. So the word futurist is fairly well established. We're, our program in Clear Lake and then again at the University of Houston was alternately called Studies of the Future and Future Studies, which is a great academic title. It's, uh, it, it, it's like African American studies, women's studies, urban studies, you name it, you name it. Uh, but the people who were emerging as professionals in the field didn't want to be part of a studies. That's for those fuzzy-headed academics. We're action people. We're out there. We're doing this kind of stuff. So we took another term, which is foresight, and repurposed it to, to describe the whole field, and I'll describe the field here in a second. So future studies is now kind of the academic word, and strategic foresight or foresight is now the um, the word that, that we use for the profession and a, as it goes. We wanted the Pro University of Houston program to be called strategic uh, graduate degree, MS, and strategic foresight, but we were told that at the, on the university committee, the business school owned the word strategic, and that if we ever tried to use it, we would get canceled. So it's now a master's degree. No, no insults here, you know, power is power, we understand that. And uh, the, um, uh, it, it goes along. So we have really two words for the field, one the academic word and the other the professional word. And uh, it goes along like that. These are some of the words that, that, that started uh, it all going. So what does the field look like? Well, it's two big divisions uh, because we tend to divide change into two gigantic sources, what the world is going to do and what we do with that. The future is created through the inter uh, interaction, the braiding of these two streams. It's almost like a helix of these two things going forward. Uh, it, we start there because I came to study social change and sociology, unfortunately found out that there is very little social change in sociology. I don't know if there are any sociologists in the group here today. I did my research. I picked the top 10 intro textbooks in sociology and looked at how much of their text was about social change. I did this first in about 2007, 2008. Three of those texts didn't even have a chapter on social change, and seven did. When I did it again about 2012, 2013, all of them had a chapter on social change. That's progress. Of course, it is only one chapter, and it's always the last chapter, okay? How many really get to the last chapter, right? This is cramming for exams, coming up to Christmas, coming up to summer vacation. Oh, you can read these last few chapters on your own. So we, we, really, so we really start talking about change. How does change work, particularly social change, and, and how does it uh, actually action in society? That's the forecasting side, describing alternative futures, describing how what could happen in the world absent our intervention, most of which we can't change anyway. So it's what's coming, we call it inbound change. Then there is the outbound change. We're not just spectators. We're not victims. We're not completely powerless. We can't change most of what the world is going to do, but we each have a sphere of influence. 
and it is that sphere of influence where we can make significant change. For ourselves, obviously, and the choices we make for ourselves personally, for our families, our kids, for our work groups, for our students in this case, we can make significant change. And that's what I think brings a whole lot of more meaning to life rather than just, oh, here it is, this is what we do, this is how we've always done it. So having um, one of my ideal utopian visions of an organization is that every person in that organization has a strategic goal, has a goal that they are working towards, no matter how minor. I mean, it can be the maintenance guy, it can be the receptionist, it can be the, the, the faculty member, it can be, you know, whatever, the secretary. This is how I'm improving my sphere of influence. And so the good thing is that we all have a lot more empathy for each other <laughs> rather than a few people out there trying to create change and the rest back in the bunker, you know, kind of throwing lob and bombs at them <laughs> and saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. So that's just my utopian view of how all that goes. So two big divisions. So I have a, a marine image here, which is a ship, has a captain, and the captain determines where the ship is going to go. And it has a, it has a mate and the mate is in charge of organizing. So this is the authority of the ship and the manager of the ship, CEO, COO, however you want to call it. There are two futurists on the ship. One is the lookout, person who announces to the crew, there's this change, there's this change, there's this change, and then the navigator who takes that and other information and plots the course. Those are the two big divisions of forecasting. Here's this change going on and planning. Here's where we, what we should do about it. Now those things are analytically separate but they're always intertwined. So what the world does affects what we do. What we do affects what the world does. So these, this is an analytical distinction, but they work together all, all back and forth all the time. Here's a slightly more complex run out. Um, Andy uh, and I, Andy Hines, took over the program from me. He's really the writer in our team. And we, we wrote this book based upon advice that we received from our colleagues in the Association of Professional Futurists. Our question was, what advice, tips, techniques would you share with brand new people doing foresight? And they sent us hundreds of those. We took 140 of them, put it into a standard thing, and we organized them according to these seven categories of ideas, tips, techniques. It's not a process, though it could be looked as one. Uh, and that book itself is just a set of, it's more like the chemical handbook. It just has lots of information in it. Framing, obviously. Every project is about getting started. What are we doing? And this project particularly important because Nobody's ever done this before. What do you get from it? What's the value? How long is it going to take? What's the process? So framing is important. The two categories for inbound change is research. And we have a kind of, uh, 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 ours is primarily secondary research or primary research in terms of interviews, sometimes surveys. But we're also looking for something called weak signals. We're looking for something which most of us were not trained to look for, and that's little things that have not changed the future yet and are not very important but they could be, because every big change starts out as a little change. I have a picture when I talk about weak signals of kids walking across a creek in a park, a pretty day in northern Minnesota. The name of that creek is the Mississippi River. So the Mississippi River begins as a little creek and ultimately becomes. Now, how many weak signals really create big rivers? Very few. But unless you're really kind of realizing the change is starting out way out there in the hinterland, now you can't, you can't you can't understand them all, you can't track them all, but at least getting a sense that change of small things can have large impact, that's another one of the learnings that we bring. Then there is the uh, outbound change, which is three steps, visioning, goal setting, what do we want to accomplish, planning, organizing, uh, and then action and implementation. So this is also kind of the, if you were to teach foresight as a process, this is the way we teach it at the University of Houston. We have two primary courses, but again, for graduate students, one is futures research, which is the forecasting side, and the other is the uh, advanced strategies, which is the planning side. But every course has a project in it where students go through this. So they've been through three or four of these major term projects by the time they graduate. Again, we're preparing professional futurists. But understanding where change is coming from for everyone all the students here at this university, I believe is important, and knowing that they have some influence about how to go about it, not at the professional level, but at a personal and, and, and better level there. So how is future studies different than traditional forecasting? Uh, you can read those for yourself. I think the most, the key one is to focus on discontinuities. 
Notice that if you're going to do traditional forecasting, all of the trends are continuous. If you ask people to describe the past, what do they talk about? They talk about what they learned in history class, right? Which are almost always events. A war, a new technology, a new, a new law, da 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 And they ask them to describe the future, and it's all trends. They don't know any events of the future, so they're not allowed to say, well, this is a possibility or this is a possibility. And so their future is without disruptions. Well, that's not a very accurate view of the future. Now, how do we solve that problem? We can't predict disruptions any more than anybody else can. But we can imagine what some of them might be so that we are practicing in a kind of a mental simulation. Well, if this thing happens, then we're going to be in this kind of a world. And this thing happens, we're going to be in this kind of a world. And that, I believe, is a learning and a skill that is important for, on, on the one hand, making good use of the present, but also being ready to move, resiliency if you want to call it, being ready to move when the signs and when, when the disruptions do occur. So we're, 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 we're trying to form a balanced view. It's not all going to be the same, and it's not all going to be completely different. It is somewhere in, in between. And as a result, because we can't predict disruptions, uncertainty dominates. Not certainty. Not what we know, but what we don't know. And the difference between foresight and we always know that there are things that we don't know. Everybody says you can't predict the future. Okay. We actually give the reasons why. Here's this uncertainty. Here's this assumption that we're making. Here's this the way the world is today. What if that changes? What if that changes? What if that changes? So uncertainty, though we're not celebrating uncertainty, we're trying to leave it on the table and not assume it away as, well, now that we've made that assumption, then, then we don't have to deal with it anymore. Well, w we may not have to deal with it, but the world didn't know we, <laughs> we, did, we made that assumption, and the world is not necessarily bound by the assumptions that we have. One of the most uh, serious, dramatic examples of that I came across was a plan done by Louisiana State University in preparation for a hurricane in New Orleans. It was accomplished in 2004, July of 2004. Uh, what, would, what would happen, how to evacuate, and how to deal with New Orleans as uh, in a Category 3 hurricane, which exactly what it got, called Hurricane Katrina. The very first page of that report listed their assumptions, which is what we all did when we took a, did a physics lab. We had to list our assumptions and all that. They listed the assumptions. The very first assumption was the levees will hold. Well, <laughs> so the problem was not that they didn't list their assumptions. They did. The problem was they didn't challenge those assumptions. They didn't ask the other question, which is, well, what if it doesn't? And that's where we come to thinking about the future as a set of alternative futures, not one expected future, and then the rest are assumed away to be less probable. They are less probable, but they are still plausible, and we need to be ready for all kinds of different alternatives. So that's kind of the, the field as it, as it exists. This last slide is just, you know, we're not going to read all of these. Andy did a, a survey. A little survey of his clients when he was a practicing futurist. And he said, why did you hire us? What, what did you get from it? We used the uh, six categories that we had in the Thinking About the Future book. And you see, more diverse, open, and balanced, uh, non-biased, focusing on questions and problems, influencing assumptions and mental models, all the way down to constructing pathways from the present to the future, building alignment. And, I mean, each one of these. Shouldn't these be, some of these, be our learning objectives? Not just for your individual class, but even across a college that really took the future seriously? Wouldn't these kind of things, the, the ability to do this, not as a professional futurist, but as a citizen, as a worker, as a parent, a person who understands that the future is multiple and that yet they have some degree of influence over how it's going to emerge? So my point is that this is a real thing. Uh, I stand here and tell you that this is not a fad, that there is an academic and a rigorous uh, background to it. We have, a, we have a theory. We've been teaching it. People are now practicing it all over the world. And uh, we're just really proud to, to have been part of that and to bring this to you. So if you want to get, an, you know, be the first kid on your block <laughs> to teach the future seriously at the university, uh, I would love to be able to help that with that. So let me pause for a second and see, I'm sure there's a half a dozen reasons, just like I was with the dean there, I got a lot of reasons why you can't do this. Okay, let's hear some of those or, or anything else, because then we're going to talk a little bit more about 
what the real purpose of teaching of the t- teaching the future is. Please. Uh-huh. The table of knowledge is the way they say yep. practicing knowledge. Right. Mm-hmm. Do you like incorporate that in or merge that? I mean, because data analysis seems to be used right. to predict what will happen. Right. Machine learning, deep learning, uh, big data, all of that goes by various titles. The first thing that, I, and I, I'm just an observer of that, I've not studied it at all. One thing I realize, however, is that on all of the applications of machine learning, you have millions and millions of cases. You know, you got a million pictures, you know, Netflix pictures of pictures which have cats and don't have cats. And the algorithm can figure out which has cats and which doesn't. The future, unfortunately, is a one-off. We don't have millions and millions of cases. We have unique periods in history that had a certain number of forces driving change, certain number of plausible alternatives. So frankly, I don't think, that we, 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 we do touch it in our World Futures course, which reviews new technologies as part of, a part of what that course does, as a big change for the future, but not so much for our profession. Because I don't see how you turn an algorithm which requires thousands if not millions of cases to learn how things work to um, uh, in you know when you really just pre- when you really just have one case which is human history <laughs> and so I don't know where you get the thousands of cases to train train the machine is that kind of close to where that is so I, I'm not uh, to, to put it bluntly I'm not concerned about machines taking this over right now yeah please Oh, okay. Hey, hey, Hello. everybody. <laughs> Thanks. So, if you don't mind moving back to the previous page, mm-hmm. uh, and the pr- one prior to that. Sorry. Uh, so before that. Uh, yeah, this one. So, uh, aren't we uh, sort of conflating the two? Because here you're talking about foresight, sort of techniques. So yes. The first piece is about how to look into the future. Yes. If you will. The second piece, the visioning, the planning, and the acting, yep. is more once you've done the first piece, right. what, sh- what should you do, it, do about it as a business imperative? Yep. So it's two separate things, right? It's two divisions, but they are, uh, as I say, interactive. In other words, I mean, I call that the academic view, mm. or the, you know, let's you know, look before you leap, yep. let's study it, and then come up. Now, action-oriented people uh, first want to do the visions and the goals. This is what we want to accomplish. This is our mission. Th- and, and that's okay. You don't have to do it in this exact yep. procedural order. Before one makes goal, m- before one decides on strategies, however, right. take a look out the window and see how the world is changing. Because what usually happens on the planning side is this is what we want to accomplish. This is how we're going to accomplish it. Who's going to be in charge? Go. And, no b- and you're assuming that the world is going to be hold, it's static until you're done. Well, if, you're d- if your plan's a year or two from now, maybe, pr- probably. If you're building a building that's going to last 20 or 30 years, or you're developing a weapon system, or you're developing uh, a, new, a new line, a new platform of products that's going to supposedly make you money for 20 years, you better pay attention to how the world is going to be 20 years from now. No, got it. Uh, another question. So as, as a statistician, sort of did you try to, try to validate the approach using a backcasting approach? So for instance, if you were to... Uh, do a b- bit of a thought experiment that you were in 1700, sure, and you had access to this knowledge, and you had access to this technique. What would that have you predict the f- future, which is now, as? And then, what would you? Uh, how would you? What would you infer from th- from that? Again, it's very f- it's very uh, soft. No, no, but I think uh, it's well. It's but it's harder than what we would generally. Th- be interested in because we're not so much we're not predicting first of all uh, if you do seven scenarios you're going to be wrong most of the time which is a real it's just a real block to our egos I mean you know I do all these scenarios now so getting a prediction right which is a, which is a rifle approach versus doing a whole bunch of scenarios which is a shotgun approach we're wrong when we're surprised not when the future turns out differently than the expected future but if it's completely outside all of the scenarios that we created. I have to tell you one of my worst failures was uh, one of our graduates got a job with Enron. I think even you heard about Enron way up here. 
Uh, it was a little workshop that, that, you know, staff members, it wasn't any kind of big strategic planning thing. One of the scenarios was not the bankruptcy of Exxon, which occurred within the year. Uh, I don't know that I could do that. We had, a, we had an engagement for this huge network of credit agencies. We were not financial people. We probably shouldn't have done it in the first place. But we were futurists, so we said, sure, we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, we didn't tell them they were going to lose $50 million with Lehman Brothers in 2007. Uh, so those were surprises that fell outside the envelope. But we believe that we're, therefore, more accurate if we use this broad brush the shotgun, and we give people a sense being ready for different kinds of futures is what this is about. This is more about mindset. We don't wait around for 10 years and see whether we're right or not. Sometimes we are. I mean, I think Alvin Toffler's Future Shock and Third Wave were immensely prescient for their time. H.G. Wells wrote a, wrote a book in, the er, in 1900 called Anticipations in which he got almost everything right. It was really brilliant. I think that's more a question of luck. I mean, it's like the it's like the, the best stock trader in Wall Street each year. Well, <laughs> you know, they're usually not they don't generally do two years in a row, <laughs> and so um, it's not so much getting it right; it's being pre prepared for whatever exists. And and we're counteracting, we're challenging this view of the future as the end of a road, or the end of a river, a destination. It is more like a river delta of alternative futures and that we have to think about how are we going to live when some of these less probable futures occur? Are we resilient? Are we prepared? Can we be successful that way too? So thanks for that question. Yes, sir, please. You mentioned uh, autonomy and purpose right. in pr pursuing the, um, the, the vision, the institutional vision. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, which champions the individual. Yeah, uh, and makes that person feel really good about uh, their place. Okay. However, in terms of the decision-making processes of mm -hmm. the institution, it seems like uh, the there's this broad vision, and then there are relatively few people that are really do have the power. Yes. To uh, you know right. to to sail the ship. So yep. it's. Uh, uh, I think that um, it the reality is the that reality. a lot of this this design thinking creates a lot of anxiety and a lot because of maybe over, over expectations and it feels that you know how pe that if you take the individual and their life at home in the middle class and I think they comp they see this kind of thing at their places of employment, businesses. And what it feels like to, I think, a lot of people is that the institutions take precedent over their own personal lives, which mm -hmm. are driven by data, mm -hmm. which is, of course, selectively mined and then um, uh, used for whatever rationales there are for action. So you get where I'm going? Uh, no, and, and let me tell you about a discussion, a little dispute I had with a colleague on Saturday. I went to a conference there. She's a wonderful uh, museum director at a children's museum in San Antonio, and one of their objectives was to give students the chance to be anything they wanted to be. And they're dealing with very young children. My point is you teach that, that's not complete. It's not a lie, but it's oversold. You can't be anything you want to be. There are constraints. So if we're talking to college students, I think we can get that across. You have the opportunity to create change. You can achieve a vision for the whole organization. Probably not. Even the CEO can't oftentimes because they, they, they screw it up when they, when they try to create change. Let me give you my best example. So m m the answer to your question is if, they, if it's too big, then they've chosen the wrong goal, the wrong vision. Choose one that you have at least some chance of creating, no matter how small. And this one is a guy named Bruce Renfro. I heard about him on NPR about 10 years ago. He took an elevator in the subway system of New York City and created a transformational experience for the 3,000 people who lived in that neighborhood. He brought in plants. He brought in flowers, pictures. He played jazz, sm slow jazz. He introduced people. He introduced himself, people. He ran this elevator in one subway stop for, what, five years? 
and people on the radio said, this is the best 20 seconds of my day. The whole community got to know each other because they rode the same elevator. Now, he's an elevator operator, and I'm, you know, I heard this and said, if he's doing this, he's created a transformation within his own world, who can't think about a transformation within their world, within their class, or within their office, or whatever it is? Not the, not the grand mission, not the grand vision of the organization, but that choosing the sphere of influence and choosing the size of the goals that, is, that you can't guarantee success, but you at least have a better chance than saying, oh, you can you know, have this great gigantic visionary future. Your vision could be the best elevator in the world. Wow, and, and an elevator that really transforms the experience of elevator riding. So we have to be, and we have to teach this stuff. Not just, you know, you're gonna create world peace, but what could you do in your world that would be remarkable? That people would go, wow, that was great, how did you do that? That's the, that's the kind of vision that we want to have. Okay, so that, oh yeah, please, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, no, and questions are always easy. I just wanted, you said about Enron was, you know, yes, Enron, mistake. Yeah. And was a mistake. And did I story. pick you up correctly when you said that Lehman Brothers was a surprise? Because I don't think Lehman Brothers was a surprise. You know, there was a decision made to pack up subprime mortgages that were, where money was lent to people who had no means really to repay them, there was no surprise in that to me. Well, any sort of sense, you know, in other words, this final part of your plan, the visioning, planning, and acting, ensured it happened, and they all made money. Yes. I don't think it was a surprise. Uh, well, uh, obviously, surprise has to do with expectations. You, in 2005 and 2006, you might have seen the collapse coming. I can tell you that Andy ran, uh, we, we have a required course in systems thinking, and he ran the financial system, this was about 2005, he ran the financial system using modeling, which we have, systems dynamics modeling, and the class did it as a, as a and he and one of the students took all their money out of the stock market <laughs> as a result of that. So for them, it wasn't a surprise. Uh, for the company that lost $50 million, it was a big surprise. And for most of the people, because there's a book that came out, ironically, in 2008 uh, by two economists, and the title of the book is, This Time Will Be Different. I mean, because people were making money, because the collapse had not yet happened, most people are easily convinced or convinced themselves that this is magic. We have now created magical debt, which we don't have to pay back. Now, that was in the past. The depression was that for st stock market, stock bought on margins, uh, whatever collapses you want to talk about, Y2K, all of those things. And we've given money to companies that have no cash flow and never did, and we had the, we had the tech bu bu bubble in, in, in 2001. So we always think that we've created something new which is magical, but what are we doing now that still is thought to be magical? Government debt, huge. Oh, we don't ever have to pay that back. We, you know, take it and go off. Uh, what about the internet itself? Oh, we now have this beautiful thing. We can communicate. We can buy things. We can do research. All of this. All of this. Is this a bubble? Well, so going from th the afterwards, we always see it as a bubble. If it is, going looking at it from the front end, there's a dispute. So it's a surprise to some if the internet should collapse and become unusable because of trolls or because of uh, cyber warfare or whatever, most people would be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised, but most people, you wouldn't be surprised, but most people would. Good, let me move on to the second piece, which is kind of a reiteration of some of this stuff too, and that is basically what we're going to, to try and teach. And I point this out uh, as if we're preparing students for the future, ought we not to maybe give them a little heads up <laughs> about what is, what is likely and what is possible to occur, and so that they can start thinking about this now while they're in school, rather than waiting until they get out and, and are faced with this whole thing. So we don't have time for the whole exercise, but when you ask teachers and ask yourself what you really want your students to learn. If you're in math, you want them to learn how to factor a trinomial equation. Yeah, but. If you're in history, you want them to know the battles of the Civil War. Yeah, but. Let me give you an experience of a college that actually went through this activity, Alverno College, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Anybody, anybody ever heard of Alverno College? There you go. Do you, do you know the special thing about Alverno that I'm about to talk about? You want to tell the story? So 
Right. And you know why? No. Nuns. <laughs> it, was a, it was a college. Yeah, right. It was the 70s. It was the early 70s. I, mean, I know I was in religion at that time, and I left along with all the other nuns. We didn't know each other, of course. But, uh, but so the college was about to go out of existence. And the president had called a required faculty meeting every other Friday afternoon. And each day at that meeting, one department had to stand up and say, what is your contribution to the liberal education of women? This is 1973. And they didn't say trinomials, and they didn't say battles, and they didn't say that, and they didn't say, you know, microbiology. They said these things. Competencies that are the thinking skills, that are the learning skills, that are the interaction skills that people need to be successful. And that, is a, that by itself is a terrific story, just like the elevator guy's story is. But they went further than that. They created departments out of each one of these. They have eight departments of competencies, and they went further than, so faculty are assigned to two departments in that college, one their traditional discipline and one of these competencies. And they created a vertical curriculum that starts off by teaching at a very low level these competencies in the, in the freshman year, in the sophomore year, on and on and on and on. And finally, they devote 5% of the college budget to assessment. So it's all about learning, it's about getting feedback, and they have a cohort of 500 community members who come to the college to be able to uh, a, a, a execute, basically, and implement these assessments as the, as the women go through various exercises in all four years. So every class has not only this is a junior history class, this is also a third level communication class. And they have that all spelled out with its learning objectives, its assessments, and things like that. It's, it's brilliant, and nobody else does that. <laughs> I've been talking about this. I went there in, in the uh, 20 years ago, and still that. So that's what that's what. And so this is what future studies is, and this is now we call it 21st century skills, higher order thinking. Let me ask you a question. This is a third grade question. Which one of these bullets is not like the others? Which one? The first one? No. Nope. Which one? The fourth one? No. Nope. The second one. The second one is the knowledge, information. All the rest of these are skills. So this is whatever you take it. If we were to be changing education in my ideal world, my vision, is that we would be teaching people to what they need to know in order to be successful, which is what they are going to do with that knowledge. But because we're teaching out of a text usually, or out of a, out of a syllabus, or out of state standards, or out of something, uh, we're teaching them as we were taught. We don't spend, we, we spend 80% of the time. Now, maybe in writing class, obviously that's a skill. In math, maybe a little bit of skills in terms of problem solving and mathematical calculations. And in, in science, we get a lab once in a while. But I would claim that, let's pick a number, 80% of what we're teaching is knowledge and information, not what to do with that. Now, the problem is that if you, t if you focus on skills, you won't cover as much knowledge. And most faculty members who want to do a good job, who learned all about biochemistry, and I want to try and get as much of that information into the students before they graduate, there's, there's no, so little time, and so we go on and on and on and on, and they get out of college and they know a lot, but they don't know how to do a lot. Now, Verno's claim is that their graduates fly off the shelf. They are ready to work and ready to be productive on the first day. They don't have to learn that stuff uh, uh, on the job. So instruction, exhibition, are the communication and the transmission of knowledge and information. Experience and interaction is the way that we develop skills. If you want to learn how to diaper a baby, you don't do it on a PowerPoint. You don't play golf that way. You don't play football that way. You don't uh, learn to dance that way. It is all about, here, do it this way, and now go do it. The very first day, pick up a golf club and start swinging, and you'll be terrible. But now we're going to give you feedback. And so teaching skills, the, the approach is completely different. Now, the good thing about future studies is the future studies is ideal for teaching these things because there is no text. There is no right answer, as there is in history or as there is in science. 
for as there is in math. You have to teach process. You have to teach thinking and, 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 and creating change processes if you're going to teach anything at all. So you, we, don't, we, we do deal with information, but we get that from the internet. What's happening? What are the trends? What, what, what are the weak signals? How could this turn out to be? But most of it is processing that information in teams, maybe, if, you're, if we're good, through pro, you know, PBL and all those other kind of skill building things. So even if, a, even if you're a history teacher, I claim, this is a rather extraordinary claim, it would be better to start out learning to teach skills by teaching about the future because you don't have the traditional mu muscle, muscle memory to keep doing it the way you did before. We're just going to clean the slate, then go back to history and start teaching, or then go back to math, or then go back to science and start teaching thinking processes like that. So, so what are some of these? These are the, there are five points about what what I would say are content, and two, about skills. Change comes from the world and from ourselves. Talked about that already. I think students ought to understand that. The world is changing. Let's understand how that's going. We can change it. Let's understand that. OK, change is occurring in all sectors simultaneously. Is that a big job? Yes. Is it a job that any one of us can understand in any kind of complete, canonical, um, closed-ended way? Of course not. This is spooning the ocean. But just because we can't be narrowly specialist and know everything, we have a rule in our society is before you can open your mouth about anything, you have to know everything about that. Well, we futurists are prepared to be stupid and prepared to you know, be fools of ourselves. Now, I don't go into a oil company and tell them how to run their oil company. But I do tell them about the world in 20, 10 or 20 years from now of what that oil company is gonna, could be up against. And so it is all of these, and we go through these explicitly whenever we talk about the future. Change occurs slowly. Those are trends. But once in a while, it occurs disruptively, and those tend to be surprising. Because remember, our view of the future is just the upward sloping, more computers, more population, more climate change, trends, 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 trends. And then when the disruption comes along, we say, how did that happen? That wasn't in my mental model of how the future is going to emerge. Now, if you don't want to deal with disruptions, you have to assume that we've eliminated disruptions from the world, <laughs> which is a rather silly assumption. And we would, even we would even suggest that given the speed of communication and the increasing complexity and interconnectivity of the world that that communication provides, disruptions are becoming more frequent and, and deeper. And so we, we, in our lifetime, compared to pre-industrial, compared to even industrial, we are likely to go through a number, not just careers, of disruptions within existing careers, one of which might even be education. The future is inherently uncertain and contingent. We, do, we are not sure. What we don't know is way more important than what we do know. So we deal with our uncertainty, we deal with that, and we plan and think about alternative futures anyway. My favorite story is my daughter was teaching English, seventh grade English, some years ago. She said, you're a futurist. What should I be teaching my students? She said this, contingency, alternatives. And, and I got a text from her a few months later and said, uh, a, 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 a student in my class began her answer by saying, it depends. Love that. That's what, we, you know, we, that should be the beginning of every. There's context here. There's alternatives here. We're too, too, we're, we're too, too focused on the answers and not enough on the processes. The future is many, not one. And so, tell stories. Stories are a great communication about what if this and what if that. They can't be fantastical, and that's part of what we teach. There are constraints, but there are alternatives. And make plans about possibilities not about actualities. And finally, the two skills most important, anticipate and influence. Anticipation is a great way of thinking. It's not predicting, but it's getting ready for it. It's what a tennis player is ready to receive the serve, okay, on the, t on the balls of her feet, ready to go one way or the other. And, 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 and it's, a, it's, an it's, a, it's an excite, it's, an, it's a positive emotional state. Bring it on, she's not afraid. Bring it on, I can go here, I can go there. Kids and Christmas, brides and grooms on the day before their wedding or before the birth of a baby, they're anticipating this huge change in their life. This is going to be great. And that's, I would hope, and also then in influence within our sphere of influence. 
Five questions we should be asking in every class, in every subject. What has happened in the past? What are things today? What uh, is expected to happen? What could happen instead? What do you want to see happen? And finally, what are you going to do about it? Now, that's obviously oversimplified. But we can ask those questions. We can have activities. We can have discussions about those things. And, and my, my purpose is getting the future into the classroom <laughs> and doing it however you feel is best to do it. And finally, these are kids going on a field trip. They know where they're headed. They've been briefed on that. It will be surprising. It will be a learning experience. They've never been that before. I, do these kids know where they're going? We're not, we're not showing them that. We're not sharing that with them. Now, I agree. None of us had this in, in teacher training. None of us had this in our graduate degrees. And so this is brand new. But it is a learnable skill. I learned it myself. And I, I believe that anyone who wants to say, I think we should take the future seriously in this university, can learn to teach this. And, I, and it gives you some kind of a sense of how good things can be. That's our vision. We teach the future as well as the past. That's my vision of this. Now that's a hundred years at least. But our motto is if you prepare, if you're preparing students for the future, for tomorrow, teach them the future today. So I would love to be able to you know, answer any questions, work with you. I'm, I'm already you know, talking to Steve and Lisa and the other people in the sandbox. I love that concept. I wonder if I'm supposed to meet in the sandbox. What is it? <laughs> but good luck to you. Yes, sir. Do you have a question? I was about thinking um, not to um, think to myself whether the four quiz that I ever got out of those topics. Uh, you want to you want to ask get get a further take the question? Yeah. Where does this thinking connect with the thinking associated with spirituality, morality, and sure. ethics? Where I go is that how much time, I mean, futurists are, are supposed to be part of our professional responsibility is to advocate for future generations. Not just for people today, ethically, we should do no harm, help the needy, et cetera, et cetera. But we should also try as much as possible to prepare or leave our world for future generations in as good a shape as possible. So there's a, there's a, there's a mor moral dimension to what we're doing. Well, concert, you know, if you're a, yeah, if you're a, uh, an, an, uh, that uh, Benham and Jeremy Bentham's type of futurist or type of eth ethician, then of course, yeah, consequences, implications, and we do that. We do a lot of that. Usually, we don't put moral judgments on those consequences. They are more or less what they are, and people can make their own moral judgments about them as well. Yes, ma'am. Just quickly, um, sure. it seems like there's an inherent tension and conflict always on this issue, and you know, look at climate change as a perfect example. Yep of people advocating and saying this is what's going to happen X, Y, and Z if you do this other thing. And yep. In Houston, you had that problem with the, the developments that were built in the flood zone and that were impacted by the last hurricane. Very well. And there were people who advocated at the time those developments were made and predicted that this, you know, th there's a probability of a certain percentage that this will happen, and ultimately, yep. obviously, it did. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, the powers that be often say, no, that's not going to happen, or they chase the almighty dollar, and that mm -hmm. ends up ruling the day. So, yes, right. you know, what do you do? Well, but uh, don't people do that in their own life? I mean, nutrition, exercise, sleep, saving money. We're all perfect when it comes to that, but all those other people are not. So I don't think it's just decision makers. It's the tendency to want to believe that the present is going to continue, good things are going to come about, bad things are not going to happen, so we don't need to spend money or hurt ourselves in the present to be able to prepare for and, and to mitigate long-term things. I think that's a human tendency. That's not just the tendency of decision makers. Everybody's operating on relatively short-term incentives. So. I think that's a, that's. I think we all need to share in that. As now, their their lack of it has more impact than mine does, but it, but we all kind of have that tendency. This has been great. We're running out of time. I really want to thank you for your time and for coming out today. I know you got real jobs, <laughs> real students out there who are clamoring for your attention. Uh, I'm um, um, I'm all right right up there. I'm available. Steve, Lisa know where I'm from, and uh, definitely would love to hope we can work together to bring some futures. One question that did not come up, does this have to be a separate class? No. Can be a separate class? Yes. Uh, it could be in any class. Uh, I'm, I'm coaching a, a, uh, a high school teacher on, on putting futures into an entrepreneurship course. 
I'm coaching a humanities teacher who's uh, putting it into the portfolio review that the students end up with. I can put the future into any, any course you want, and uh, we can work together on that, too. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. How's that? Okay? Great. All right. Very good. Thank you.